Psalm 12. The heading says, for the choir director, according to Sheminith, and we're not exactly sure what that means, perhaps a tune, perhaps an instrument, it goes on and says, a psalm of David. Help, Lord, for no faithful one remains. The loyal have disappeared from the human race. They lie to one another. They speak with flattering lips and deceptive hearts. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks boastfully. They say, through our tongues we have power. Our lips are our own. Who can be our master? Because of the devastation of the needy and the groaning of the poor, I will now rise up, says the Lord. I will provide safety for the one who longs for it. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace, seven purified seven times. You, Lord, will guard us. You will protect us from this generation forever. The wicked prowl all around, and what is worthless is exalted by the human race. The title of this morning's message is The Power of Words. Sanabar Khan is a Mumbai-based poet and a freelance writer who understands the power of words. And listen to how she describes that power. Words are powerful forces of nature. They are destruction. They are nourishment. They are flesh, they are water, they are flowers and bone. They burn, they cleanse, they erase, they etch. They can either leave you feeling homeless or brimming with home. In the verses we just read, in those eight brief Verses, there are eight or ten rather different references to communication or to the act of communicating. And in so many words, Psalm 12 is communicating to us the power of words. So this morning we're going to look at the power of words at work in four different ways from Psalm 12. Number one, deceitful words have the power to discourage and endanger the faithful. Now, you may remember back in Psalm 11, the situation that was happening there from last week. That situation has intensified. At least back in Psalm 11, David had friendly, well-meaning, even if they were misguided counselors. But as Psalm 12 opens, as David looks around from his seat on the bus, he's all alone. This is his conclusion. The godly one is gone. The faithful have vanished. Everyone utters lies. The discouragement in these verses is practically dripping off the page. Because it seems like, to David, the faithful have been deceived. They have disappeared. And I wonder how many of you this morning feel something similar in your circumstances. Perhaps in your relationships, former followers of Christ that you would call friends seem to have just fallen off. Perhaps they are embracing ideas and values that the church has stood against for 2,000 years, and you just feel alone. Or maybe it's at your college or in your school that it seems like you're surrounded by young men and women who have just been completely taken in by the lies of our culture of autonomy and materialism and gender as, or sexuality as identity and power. 
and you just feel in that circumstance alone. Or maybe it's in your family. Brothers and sisters, spouses, children, aunts, uncles, everyone else seems to have turned from some conception of the good and beautiful and the true and seem to be jumping into the hamster wheel of life, accepting whatever the latest value system is being pushed towards them. And as you look at your family, you just feel alone. And even in the American church, as we think about the last five years of life in our context, we see hundreds, if not thousands, of formerly faithful followers of God who filled churches prior to COVID who have just disappeared. They've been deceived by some other vision for the good life, and they've walked away from the faithful gathering of worshipers of Jesus, opting for live stream worship or an extra day off each week. Even as I'm speaking, perhaps friends and families are coming to your mind, those you love and you miss dearly. And I'm not, certainly not talking about those who have found other churches to worship in and are faithful in other local gospel preaching churches. I'm talking about the men and women who abandon orthodox practice and orthodox faith because they at some point embraced lies from flattering lips and forked tongues and double hearts. That's the situation David describes in the opening verses here. Now, we all love good stories, don't we? They help us make sense of our existence. And this is part of our DNA as humans. In fact, in every culture, the storytellers of that culture are elevated. They're celebrated. And it's true in our own culture. And often those storytellers become the agents of change within a culture, specifically as they combine fact with fiction and tell a beautiful story, a creative story, but often a story that celebrates ideas and values that the Bible calls sin. So let's just take one recent example in our culture, and this is not to bind anyone's conscience against watching this particular movie. It's simply for illustration. Take Turning Red, for instance. This recent Pixar movie tells us, among other things, and among many other things, let out your inner beast. Don't try to tame it. As well as, it's your body, it's your choice. That's one of the statements of the main character. It's my panda, it's my choice. Now, both of these messages directly contradict God's will for human flourishing. But often, narratives like these are told so creatively, so powerfully, they slowly and naturally become a part of the air we breathe. You see, words have power. And the stories we tell one another and rehearse to one another matter because deceitful words have the power to deceive. In the 1940s, an entire country was deceived by a storyteller of incredible skill who convinced, convinced them that their country's downfall could be traced to one people group. Six years later, 40 to 50 million people were dead as a direct result. Six million of those being Jews. And one of the biggest tragedies of that entire story is that the Christian church, in large part, the Christian church within Germany, turned a blind eye and became even complicit in the deeds of its leaders. Stories matter because the faithful can be deceived. In the 16 and 18 through 1800s, the popular story in our culture was that, we, 
that men and women with significantly more melanin in their skin were inferior to those with significantly less melanin in their skin. Why? Because they had more melanin in their skin. And so 600,000 black men and women were kidnapped, often by warring tribes in Africa, and sold to slave traders and shipped here to the States. And it took the death of 618,000 men in a civil war to outlaw slavery in America. And due in fact, at least in part to the fact, that many Christians believed that narrative or refused to counteract it, counteract the lie of racial white superiority, Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour of American life. Some of the faithful were deceived. Stories matter. But we don't have to go back to the 1800s. How about the beginning of 2021? Our own capital was overthrown by hundreds of individuals, not overthrown, was overrun by hundreds of individuals who believed a popular story that said a certain election had been stolen and a certain vice president had the power, if not the courage, to overturn that election. And thousands of professing Christians bought into that story and began associating Christianity and Christian symbols with partisan politics so that You could have a Jesus saves sign and a man praying in front of a cross next to images of incredible violence and destruction. Some of the faithful were deceived. Why? Stories matter. See, follower of Jesus, it's not enough to simply know the truth. It is also part of our duty to call out lies. Stories matter. Just ask our great enemy, Satan. He told the first doozy of a story to Adam and Eve. And ever since that first false story, we have been plunged as a human race into a million lies like it. And you are assaulted with it every single day. Honestly, in ways I'm not even aware of and can't even necessarily understand. Our beautiful world has been broken by lies, and we've been marked by guilt and shame. And even faithful followers of God can be deceived and fall away simply because the culture is always catechizing us. It doesn't take a break. Now, the Bible clearly teaches that a genuine disciple will not fall away, but... The Bible also teaches that a genuine disciple values truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's the exact point of our Lord's parable of the soils. So, follower of God, we ought to take careful stock of our culture at any given moment, be aware of the cultural narratives that are at play, and be courageous enough as followers of God, not beholden to any other leadership structure supremely, and to counteract those narratives with grace and truth for the health and well-being of our community of faith. Cultural narratives like the lie of individualism at the expense of community. We already mentioned this, the lie that says we can healthily exist solely as units and consumers, that we don't need to be bodily present with our community of faith, that we don't need to be known or to know others. Or how about the cultural narrative like the lie of autonomy displacing authority, that our feelings and our sensibilities actually get to determine what is right or wrong for us without the inconvenience of any external authorities like the Scriptures or the church throughout history. Or cultural narratives like the lie that individual rights overwhelm any responsibilities that I might have before God and others. Or cultural narratives like the lie that if we could only find the right cure or elect the right person, or parent the right way, or have the right things, or make the right amount, or live the right way, everything would be better. 
Psalm 12 alerts us to this reality at least. Whom or what we listen to matters. The stories we tell ourselves, the stories we take in, whether that's through entertainment choices or our news feeds or algorithm-curated social media feeds and everyday conversations, all of that matters. But it also matters that you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, take every opportunity God gives us, whether you're a policymaker or a mom or an employee or a storyteller through the graphic arts or music or journalism or writing, to take each of those opportunities as a stewardship from God to speak truth into a context of chaos and confusion and to do so graciously, humbly, but with conviction and courage. And this is countercultural. Our culture says that you can have your truth But as soon as you voice it as even remotely binding upon others, then you have failed to love those around you. Which, by the way, is actually the truth of our culture by which they're trying to bind us. You can't say that without binding us to a truth. It contradicts. But our text points out that caving to the lies of our culture actually endangers others and protects no one, especially the faithful. But there's another way we see the power of words at work. Not just the power to deceive and endanger the faithful, but number two, idolatrous words denounce the faithless. And this point will be much shorter, but notice verses 3 and 4. It's a prayer of indignation. The future king David is looking at his context and he says, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks boastfully. They say, Through our tongues we have power. Our lips are our own. Who can be our master? So behind the deceit and the lies of David's context, we see the same thing behind the deceit and the narratives of our own culture. It's idolatrous pride. Now in 1990, Snap released a song, The Power. Now, maybe you don't know all the lyrics, but I'm guessing you have heard at least one line of this song in some commercial throughout the last couple of years. I've got the power! You know the song? No one else is going to sing it. That's okay. That's all I know of that song. That song might as well be the soundtrack of verse 4. Arrogant, self-confident, assured, complete faith in their own ability to accomplish their goals and achieve their ends. After all, I've got the power. And that perspective leads to the sort of blasphemy found in verse 4. Who can be our master, our Adonai, our Lord? Who can possibly call us to submit? We have the ability through our speech to manipulate and coerce others to deceive. So whom do we need to bow the knee to? And that attitude's not unique to David's day, obviously. It's the same attitude that characterized Satan before the fall of man. And as Paul Tripp says in his book, War of Words, our words always express worship, but not always of God. So the blasphemous pride of those who rejected God surround David with deceit and manipulation. And what is his response to that? It is a cry of indignation. It's a prayer to God that says, Cut them off, Lord. Silence their blasphemy. And while those words seem harsh to our modern sensibilities, shouldn't we all desire that God would shorten the power and control of those who pridefully are hardened in their rejection of him? 
After all, the spiritual vitality of our spiritual family is at stake. Deceitful words have the power to discourage and endanger the faithless, or the faithful, rather. Idolatrous words denounce the faithless. The third way we see the power of words at work in Psalm 12 is this. True words promise deliverance for the faithful. Look at verses 5 and 6. God is speaking. Because of the devastation of the needy and the groaning of the poor, I will now rise up, says the Lord. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in an earthen furnace, purified seven times. So put yourself for a moment in David's sandals, if you will. He's discouraged, he's alone, he's frustrated, he's isolated, he's desperate for deliverance. And then like a shaft of sunlight shining through the storm clouds, the word of God comes to him and says, I will now rise up. But what is it that motivates God to act? What pulls on the heart of God in Psalm 12 to draw that response from him? The needy are devastated, and the poor are groaning. Now, if I had to guess, needy and poor aren't exactly adjectives that you and I are clamoring to be known by, right? Those aren't probably on the latest resume that you put together to hand into your boss. These are my skills, and oh, by the way, I'm poor and needy. No, we like adjectives like strong and capable and competent and assured and cool under pressure and resourceful and knowledgeable and independent and a problem solver and witty and dynamic and eloquent, smart, handsome, gorgeous, all sorts of other adjectives. But are those the adjectives that draws the heart of God? No, the people towards towards whom God's ear is bent are the needy who have no resources and the poor who groan under the oppression of the proud and they have no other recourse. Friend, the key to receiving genuine deliverance promised by God is to see and feel the weight of your own neediness in poverty. You see, in God's economy, there are only two tribes of people. There are those who know that when they are stripped down to their essence as human beings and nothing more, they are sincerely and devastatingly poor and needy. And then there are those who believe and live as if they have the resources, the means necessary, whether physical or spiritual, to make it on their own. So in which tribe do you fall? You see, safety in a destructive, deceitful society full of dangerous lies and deceitful idols is possible only for those who know they are needy and who long for safety. And what does God say say in verse 5? I will now rise up, says the Lord. I will provide safety for the one who longs for it. Now, maybe you've watched a dog sometime this summer after exercising in the heat. What are they doing? Their tongue's hanging out, it's all slobbery, and they're panting, right? Quick breaths, in and out, trying to cool off, longing for some shade or a drink. The word for long in verse 5 comes from a word meaning to pant. In this case, it's not describing, obviously, a dog panting for water. No, it's describing someone needy and poor, a human heart panting for safety, for security. And God says to the one who's panting after that, I will provide safety. But can we just ask the question that really matters? 
Can we trust Him? Can we trust God? After all, lies, half-truths, manipulation, arrogant speeches, empty talk, flattery, partial answers, gaslighting, fine print. (laughs) This is the cultural air that we breathe. So how do we know God's going to operate any different? If you're looking for an investment that you can bank on, if you want a rock-solid foundation that you can stand on when the structures of society seem really fragile, if you want someone or something to rely on that will never let you down, that you can always trust, that has never, ever once failed in its history, then hear the voice of God. My words are like silver purified seven times. Now, in the ancient Near East, a smelting furnace would be used to melt silver ore. And as that silver melted, the impurities or the slag would rise to the surface and be removed. And that process might be repeated two or three, maybe four times. But here, The image is of silver having gone through that process seven times. Absolutely, perfectly pure. And so is God's word. Perfection, purity, reliable. So you and I can bank on God's words. But how will God deliver on that promise to deliver? And is the deliverance immediate? After all, David prays for deliverance, but you get to the very last verse of this psalm, and he's still in the same situation. And how can you and I experience truthfully, deeply, the truth of verse 7, that God will guard and protect us? Well, the fourth and final way we see the power of words at work is this. The Word made flesh will surely deliver. See, John 1 describes the eternal Son of God as the Word. Why? Because He's the perfect communication of God. He's the exact visible representation of the invisible God. And that eternal Son of God, that eternal Word of God, became flesh in the person of Jesus. And we can read Psalm 12 as if it's on the lips of Jesus in his own experience. Jesus would have known this psalm by heart from his childhood. He would have memorized it as every Jewish boy or girl would have. So as you read Psalm 12, if you listen carefully and read it through a New Testament perspective, you can actually, potentially, hear the cries and prayers of the Word made flesh, kneeling in a garden, alone, forsaken, rejected, praying to God for deliverance. Rise up, Lord, deliver. I'm needy, I'm poor, I'm groaning. Let this cup pass from me. But not what I will, whatever you will. And for the Word made flesh, for great King David's greater son, Jesus, the heavens were brass. The Father turned His face away, as the song says. There was no deliverance in the moment of need. Why? Because Jesus had to die. He had to deny deliverance for himself so that he might become the agent of deliverance for you and for me. He had to die in our place so that when we, devastated and poor and needy and longing for safety, when we pray to God and seek that safety so God might answer us, 
so that when we turn from our resources and our own way to make life work and we cry out in desperation and in groaning, God's answer to us is not silence. No, he says, I will now rise up. I will provide. I will protect. I will deliver. And so Jesus is the exclamation point on the promises of verse 5 and verse 7. He provides real deliverance now from sin and guilt and shame, and he promises future deliverance when he comes to make all things new. But perhaps you're sitting here and you're saying, Isaiah, this sounds great for other people, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said. You don't know how I've blasphemed God. You don't know my present and past sin and shame. And for you, the conviction of sin may seem like a slow death. And you're wondering if God will genuinely deliver you. And hear the word of God this morning. If you will but repent of your sin and unbelief, the words of Jesus to you, pure words, true words, words to take to the, take to the bank, are these. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So as a church family, what is God calling us to from Psalm 12? Well, at least the following. First, to be people marked by the purity of the incarnate word. We must be people of the written word. Disciple of Jesus, what is shaping your view of reality? If social media or blogs or forums or Propaganda, entertainment news is shaping your view of reality more than the pure word of God, then we need to repent of those things, lay them at the feet of Jesus, and return to him and to his word. We cannot be truly Jesus-oriented and gospel-centered as a church if we're not word-centered. And this is a communal responsibility. This is not something that we can only do in isolation. We, your brothers and sisters in this room, and your neighbors, we need you to be word-centered. Consider an act of personal and corporate protection tomorrow to open the Scriptures and to lean into it, to read it, to mark it, to learn it, to memorize it, to meditate on it, to find Jesus in it. Because the lies of Satan are still powerful. And we need one another in this battle for truth. And because this is communal, I'm going to invite you once again on Wednesday nights to join us as we lay a vision for community groups. A word-centered community that finds its expression in those small groups where we preach the gospel to ourselves regularly in a small group context for encouragement and application. But second, we must be people of prayer. Our world is awash with words, and we need to intentionally cultivate silence and solitude through prayer. It's easy to forget that Psalm 12 began its life, its existence, solely as communication between a man and his God. We are overhearing David in his prayer closet and Jesus in his distress crying out to God in prayer. So make it a practice, make it a habit to pray God's words back to him, appropriating the language of Scripture and inserting your own realities. And we actually have a gift for each one of you this morning. As you make your way out the back doors, off on the right, there's a table. This is a book called Praying the Bible. By Donald J. Whitney. He simply walks through a method of using the Word of God to shape your prayers. So combining your Bible reading with your prayer life in a way that will invigorate your communication with God. Because brothers and sisters, we must be word center 
centered, prayer oriented people because words have power. So let's, in these next few moments, as we consider these realities, as we recognize our need to return to Jesus in repentance and faith, we now get to respond to God's word, turning back to Jesus through the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. So let's pray together. Father, we confess that we ourselves are marked by the deceit and the manipulation, the flattery, the pride of our culture. So we confess this to you and we lay it before you and seek and ask for your forgiveness. And we claim your forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, now we turn our attention to the sacrifice of Jesus that makes our communication with you possible, that makes our forgiveness of sin possible, that makes our new life in Christ possible because he died so that we might have life. He was denied deliverance so that we might be delivered. And Father, we ask that you would use these moments to confirm more and more in the hearts of your children, that we are loved by you, we are owned by you, that you care for us, that you hear us, and that you are for us because of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.